about now? Testing, testing. Oh, right. There we go. Okay. So I, uh, you might notice that this is uh, written down as uh, podcast number two. I actually started one a couple days ago, but I didn't really get too far into it. Now, I think I find uh, that if I'm too scripted, it actually ends up being a little more boring. And I'm already pretty boring, so I don't want to compound my boredom. Okay. Um, a few things happened have been happening. Uh, Book Zero is at the Proofreaders. Book Zero is um, the newest uh, installment for the Arc Light Saga. It's going to be coming out this October, so uh, within the next two weeks, possibly three weeks, probably closer to two, though. Um, it's not especially that long. When I say not long, I mean it's like 40,000 words. Um, it started out, it is a standalone book, so it's not technically the same storyline. But um, it has characters that are going to be in book three, so I strongly suggest you read it. And um, it's available for pre-order right now. It's called Why Dragons Hide. Um, you can pre-order it now if you're forgetful. Um, day one sales are actually a bit more helpful than uh, pre-orders, but both are equally as good. So if you do either of those things, if you buy it the first day or if you pre-order it now, I will love you forever. Um, kind of a segue from that. Um, is my experience with Amazon uh, client support. And I don't say customer service because Amazon doesn't consider um, authors to be customers. You know what I mean? So they don't really have uh, like a number to call or they don't really have like, like they have support, but it's not the same thing because you're not buying anything from them. So, okay, so here's the story. There are categories on Amazon, right? Everyone knows that. They have different lists. Like they have the epic fantasy bestselling list the romance, best-selling, fantasy lists, etc. To get on some of these lists, um, you can't just get on them. You have to actually ask. One of them is called Military Fantasy, and I really want it to be on that uh, on that list. And you might uh, probably see why if you read my books that I would consider them Military Fantasy. Um, but you can't just get on there. Like, There's other categories where you can just change in your book data. You can change it and say, oh, this is now romance. This is now epic fantasy can't do that for military fantasy it's really hard to get on the list and uh i heard from uh lindsey broker who uh does another podcast she's a really famous fantasy writer she says the only way to get on to military fantasy is to ask amazon so i shoot an email to amazon uh and i get a response back and they say sorry we can't add books to this category it can't be done it's impossible the books this data is set and it can't be changed I'm like, that's not what I've heard. Then I, I put a few more, I give them some links. And I'm like, well, how'd these guys get on it? And they said, uh, we're going to expedite your claim. So they expedited my claim. And three days later, I heard nothing. So I sent another email and I got a different customer service rep, client support rep. And they said, sorry, same thing. Sorry, we can't do it. Can't change your category. And then a third time, um, the stars aligned somehow. And it gave me the option of contacting the people by phone. So I do a call. I pick it up. The lady says, yes, how can I help you? And I tell her what I, I, the help, help I need. And she, I'm like, can you add me to military fantasy? She does it in like 10 seconds. So I got the four-day runaround, and then she does it. And I call them in 10 seconds. The book's on military fantasy. Being on military fantasy is a big deal. Um, it's a less aggressive, less competitive category because it's so new. It's a very new category. Stormlight Archives, uh, Brandon Sanderson's Oathbringer is on military fantasy. In fact, he, him and uh, Jim Butcher, uh, they're some of the big fantasy authors on that. And obviously they're dominating the top spots. But it's an easier uh, thing for me to get number one on. Um, I, my plan is, I don't know if this is going to happen, it's for book zero to be number one. If it can be, I think it's possible. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen on military fantasy. So I'm putting all my eggs in this basket and trying to see if this I can push the, the ranks up. So if you do uh, buy it, buy it on day one. It helps me tremendously. And if you uh, want to pre-order it, pre-ordering helps me as well. Okay, so that's my Amazon story. I think I will mention some 
publishing tips. And I'm actually going to talk about self-publishing since that's what I do. I did get, uh, some of you will remember this, I got an offer from a publishing house several months ago. And I, I mentioned it on Facebook uh, that I might be going with them. I'm officially not going with them. Uh, there are several reasons I'm not going with this particular one. I'm not saying I'll never go with the publishing house. But this particular one just, it couldn't do enough for me. They even wanted to keep my current covers. They're like, oh, you can keep those covers. They look nice. I'm like, well, you're not giving me new covers. You know, you only have a few, you don't really have any crazy hits. They have a few, you know, good sellers, but most of their stuff's low list. It doesn't seem like they could really do anything that I can't do now. If that makes any sense. Like if they were Harper Collins or Tor or something, I'd be like, oh, well, yeah, I'll do it. But right now, it, they just don't seem like they're... Uh, They'd be the best for me. I'd rather keep doing what I'm doing because I think it's going very well. Um, but it's for self-publishing. Okay, so if you're going to self-publish, you uh, want to do it on Amazon KDP. Uh, KDP is Kindle Direct Publishing, and it really should be the only one you do it on. Um, the reason is if you do um, self-publish under Amazon, they'll give you an option to enroll in KDP Select. Basically, it just means people pay $9.99 a month to uh, read books. They can read as many books as, books as they want for $10 a month. And if you put your book in that, they can read that under the Kindle uh, Unlimited program. And uh, what will happen is instead of getting paid by the download, you get paid by how many pages they read. It's usually like half a cent per page. So if you do, But if you do that, you can't put your book on Barnes & Nobles or Kobo or anything else. So if you... Self-publish, do it on KDB Select. Find a good category, like I was just mentioning, military fantasy. Find a good category, one that works, one that's not super competitive. If you go on romance, I mean, Bella Forest is just dominating romance. <laughs> if you're doing romance, it's going to be really hard to break in. Um, I mean, you can still do romance, but just find like a subcategory that you can you can nail, you know. F uh, fantasy is a hard one, too. Military science fiction is really hard to break into. So, uh that's a, epic fantasy is pretty tough too. Obviously, there's a lot of that. Uh, don't skip on the covers. Um, I like my covers. Actually, you can see a few behind me. Uh, work on those covers. Um, you don't have to spend a crazy amount of money, but you know, make them look professional. Don't do them in paint or something. It looks really bad. They say don't judge a book by its cover, but people really do. They they really really do. Actually, I think originally mine were a little too complicated. I had to simplify them. Okay. Let's see what we got here. So book zero is coming out in two weeks. What else did I say I was going to talk about? Client support, more publishing tips. Okay, random publishing tips. Hmm. Uh, people say, like, do a lot of social media. I kind of agree, but I don't think you should do everything. Focus on like two things. I f typically focus on Facebook and Twitter. And then even Twitter, I don't really focus on. I only do that. You're not going to get any readers off of Twitter. You get them off of Facebook. And one thing you can do, and a lot of people don't know this, but you can only do this if you create like a separate page. Like you can't do it if it's a personal page. But like I, my page is a, is like an organization page for CM Hayden. Is if you comment somewhere else, um, if people like your comment, if you click their like, it'll give you the option to invite them to like your page. And this will only work maybe one out of every 10 times. But I mean, if you get a, a post and 100 people like it, that's 10 more followers you get. Now, a large amount of those people are just going to drop off. They're not going to buy your book. But some of them will just because, you know, oh, they're there. I'll buy, I'll buy their book. Um, it's a really powerful tool. And I don't think many authors know about it. Um, people hear about like doing social media, but not many people think about like, oh, I can get followers by commenting on unrelated things or like tangentially related things. Like, uh, sometimes I'll comment on like Game of Thrones stuff or Name of the Wind stuff. And if you make a witty comment or something, people will like it. Then you just click that and it'll open up a little screen. It'll say invite, 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 invite. That's how you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of followers without actually investing much money. Uh, your first book is probably probably going to be the one that Amazon promotes the most. 
when I say your first book, I don't mean the first one in your series. What I mean is the first one you upload onto Amazon. I don't know how their algor algorithm works, but for some reason, the first one you upload will always have more visibility than the later ones. I think what it's trying to do is like see how well you sell. So if you're gonna publish, that first one is gonna be your best chance at breaking in. I don't know if this is 100% true. This is, just, this is just my experience. So, oh, avoid pre-orders. If you're a new author, do not do pre-orders. It's not a scam, but it's not something that's gonna help you. Pre-orders are really helpful with like traditionally published authors because it helps them get on like the New York Times bestseller list or like the Washington Post, that's you know, USA Today, those kinds of things. But in those cases, they count pre-orders as day one sales. Amazon lists, which are the only ones you're gonna worry about uh, at the beginning, do not count pre-orders as day one sales. They count them as sales when the person pre-orders them. The only thing they really help you get on is the hot new release, the hot new release list, which is very important. But you're gonna probably be on the hot new release list anyway. It's I would say avoid pre-orders until you have an established fan base. Like for example, like I got like 1,100 followers on Facebook. If I ask people to I ask people to pre-order, and I got you know a couple hundred pre-orders, which is good. Um, so I'll need you know day one sales though to back that up because I'm pretty sure I'll have both. Avoid pre-ordering on Amazon. Um, so stay on Amazon. That's my uh, tip. Good covers. Editing. Yes. Uh, do not skimp on editing. Um, and make sure other people read your book. Do not upload your book without um, at least a couple people reading it. And more importantly, people you don't know. Like, here's the thing. <laughs> Your friends love you. Your family loves you. They're not going to tell you that your book sucks. They're not going to. Um, but people on the internet are assholes. They will tell you. It makes it might be it might sound terrible, but you need to put your book in front of other people who have no social ob obligation to lie to you. Um, and if you're afraid of them saying it's bad. I mean, get ready because being an author means that people are going to hate what you do. I actually once got a review on Goodreads, and this is the only thing it said. <laughs> it's a, one of my, yeah, I think it's my only one star on Goodreads. I don't have any, any one stars on, on, on Amazon, but it says, the only thing I liked about this book is that it was short. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I guess I can accept that. But, uh, one thing you don't want, you don't want to get bad reviews uh, due to the editing, part, little editing mistakes. You know, I can I can accept that people who don't like just don't like my writing, or they don't like the story, or they think it's dumb. But um, I don't want people, you know, technical things lowering my ratings. That's not something I want. And actually, that is what happened. I had to actually republish my first book a long time ago, just because I didn't know these things. So no one ever told me. You know, people, are, you can read something a hundred times, literally, and I read the book one hundred times, and still you will not find everything. In fact, the more you read it, the more blind you become to problems. It's actually one of the reasons why uh, book two and book zero and actually book one happened to are like book zero is at the proofreaders now because even after I've read it and four other people have read it, I'm getting a professional to finish it because even after all that, there's going to be something we missed. There just is. There's nothing we can do about that. In fact, there still might be something after all that. I mean, I, I've been finding, uh, mis I found mistakes in Name of the Wind and uh, and Mistborn. I found like spelling mistakes and like grammatical, not grammatical, there's some grammatical things. Or like in Mistborn, there's a, a big mistake that I'm surprised no one found. I'm sure they fixed it recently. But at the end when, uh, spoiler alert, when Ven confronts the Lord Ruler and they're, uh, they actually attribute dialogue to the wrong person. And it's really jarring. Like when you see it, you're like, oh, that's not, it's not supposed to be him saying that. Uh, Name of the Wind has some classic blunders uh, here and there. Even Lord of the Rings has some. Um, so it's going to happen, but you don't want it to be super distracting to the story. Uh, other. Hi, Austin. Thank you for the like. All right. Other tips. Other tips and tricks. Oh, yes. Um, for ebooks, you can link things, and you should. Uh, you can put your website there. If you open one of my books, it says arclightsaga.com. You can click the link. It'll take you to my website. Make sure your website looks reasonably professional. If you don't have any website experience, I strongly recommend you just getting a blog, like a blog spot or a Wix, something like that. Something that won't uh, look tacky because there's nothing worse than looking tacky when someone clicks your, your link. Um, probably the biggest advice I can give you 
aside from like actual content of your book is formatting. Uh, formatting is a huge, huge deal that everyone gets wrong. And the problem is that it looks really, really hard when you first see it, and it's not hard. Um, basically what happens when you upload a manuscript, you'll like upload a Word file. It, often you can do a Word file onto KDP. It'll like try to reformat it into a Kindle version. What happens is that it's not a perfect system, and it there's certain ways you need to uh, you need to line up your uh, your file to upload correctly into a Kindle format. Hi, Mary Beth. Um, you'll need to play with it a little bit. You'll have to add page breaks, and you'll need to do your research. But it's vitally important that when you when people open your their your book in Kindle or on their e-reader that it's formatted correctly. If it's not, people will notice. How's it going, Mary Beth? What are you doing here? What was I talking about? Oh yes, formatting, super important. I love you too. <laughs> um, super important, people, a lot of people don't do it. It's gotta be done. And people will notice, they'll notice, it's one of the first things they'll notice is that the formatting's wrong, or like there's no table of contents, or like if they use the table of contents, it doesn't go to the right spot. Those are uh, very important things. I see, yep, I'm just streaming, I do that sometimes. What else was I gonna say? Okay, the movie, I'm gonna do a segue, we're gonna talk about the movie It. Did you see It, Mary Beth? pretty good. Okay, so here's something a lot of people don't miss when they watch It. And I actually, a friend of mine asked this. He said, why does It become a clown? Like, doesn't he realize that's scary? And here's the answer. No, he doesn't. <laughs> so It is like a cosmic entity from the macroverse. I know. But like, he, when he turns into a clown, he thinks that the kids like that. Like he does, he can be scary really easily. And he's trying, he thinks a clown is like funny and silly and it will attract the kids towards him. Like he's like from like the, like he crashed, I was thinking like the 1700s. And I guess clowns were, you know, really funny back then. Like that was the thing, clowns. But like, so he's still a clown from back in the day. And he's like, oh, kids love clowns. So I'll turn into a clown, not realizing that clowns are fucking terrifying. <laughs> So it's not that he's trying to be scary. He's trying to be funny, and he thinks that the kids are going to like him as a clown. But clowns are just terrifying. Get what I mean? Like, he, I think that's even how the actor kind of played it. Like, he was, like, trying to be, like, when he's in the sewer with Georgie. He, a tra well, yes, he can transform into whatever scares you. But the clown isn't to scare the kids. The only, only one kid's afraid of clowns. Like, Georgie likes clowns. He turns into a clown to get them to come to him. And then he turns into their greatest fear. Right? The clown isn't the greatest fear except for the one kid. The clown is meant to lure them in. But honestly, if the kids saw a clown like that, they'd probably run. I certainly would run. Yeah, there's only one kid who's afraid of clowns. All the other ones, but other than that, he turns into like your greatest fear. So he, for uh, Billy, he turns into Georgie, and for uh, yeah, mm -hmm. did you pre-order my book, Mary Beth? If you haven't, I'm very sad. Super important. I need to get on that hot new release list. It's going to be coming out uh, in two weeks. Pretty excited about that. Oh, you did? When did you do that? It's going to be done soon. It's actually at the proofreaders now. Oh, did I... They show you this? I think I showed you this. It's my medal. Huh? 
Fancy. Pretty fancy. They also got these little stickers. And you stick them to the book. And they got like, blah, like, they're like when you get lost. Your phone is dying? All right. Take care, Mary Beth. All right. All right, other publishing tips. I can think of some besides heavy editing and making sure other people see your work. Uh, you want to kind of like f when you when you do launch your book, you want to front load all of all of everything into the first couple of days because those first couple of days are going to be when Amazon decides like how to um, parse your book. So you want to get as many sales in the first couple of days as possible. I mean, that might seem obvious, but it actually is really super important because it weighs recent sales higher than it weighs uh, older sales. Um, so like you can actually get high, you can actually get your rank higher than some really established authors books if you get your sales quicker because it doesn't really matter how much the book costs some people says it does but it, i don't think it does if your book is 2.99 and the other person's is like brandon sanderson's 16.99 obviously people are going to buy brandon sanderson's book no matter how much they cost but a lot of people will buy your book if it's 2.99 they just want something cheap there's a chance that you'll be higher than some other authors and that's a, a boon to like your cred it's very important on like on a little tangent since i love rambling uh and because we talked about it on the last podcast actually i think uh, someone asked me this specifically and that's um that uh patrick rothfuss his dad is dying and like when i say dying he i mean he's dying uh like probably within the next few days if he's not already passed away um i remember in the last one i said that he didn't seem very nice in person but you know, you never know, really know what people are going through. I mean, he mentioned that his father was sick. But it's one of those things, you know, people say, oh, this person's sick. But you don't really know how serious it is. I think it's funny now that he released that and he told people, hey, my dad's about to die. And he's been dying for some time. All of a sudden, everyone on Reddit and his Facebook are all suddenly super supportive. And no one's asking him about book three. I'm not saying that. How do I say this gently? You know, he's still, it's just like everyone else, you know, our family members might pass away. We still have to go to work the next day. You know, book three will still need to be finished. But I think maybe it softened people to realize that, hey, this is just a, a guy, you know. Rothfuss may, like, write what we love, but he's just a person. He's not a writing machine. He has problems, you know. He's even admitted he's, he has uh, emotional problems. A lot of writers do. That's like a writer thing. I don't know. I wish him the best. You know, we might be another five years before we see the third book, but you know, he's got to get through these things in his life just like the rest of us. It's a shame. A lot of my friends are like their parents, not their parents, but like their grandparents, their great aunts and great uncles are passing away. You get to like, when I mean, you get to like that middle age area, like late 20s to your 30s and such, it's like when a lot of the older people in your family start passing away. It really is very sad. So I will be having a uh, a booth at Monroe Comic, sorry, Monroe Motor City Comic Con this uh, this coming year. I actually have to register it on January in January. So I'll talk a bit more about that when it gets closer. But I want to have like a bunch of artwork, book giving away a bunch of books, doing a signing, maybe meeting some fans. That'd be a lot of fun. I went. Well, this this year, 2017, but I really didn't uh, have a booth or anything. I just kind of went and meandered about. I really want to do like a booth where I can actually meet people and talk to them. 
looking at a few things. I know my random rambling might not be as coherent, you know, as some other streamers, but I don't know. I don't really like writing things. <laughs> Ironically, I don't really like writing things down that I have to say. I just say whatever is on my mind. Don't worry, you don't have to listen to all these. All right, so those who have not pre-ordered Book Zero, I'm going to read the uh, the blurb. I'm not going to read it in any fancy way, but okay. <clears throat> it says, uh, this is for Book Zero, which you should pre-order right now if you haven't already. It says, to rise through the ranks of the Magisterium, magic-wielding students are pitted, pitted against each other in vicious survival matches. That does happen. I actually tried to make that sound a little more impressive than it actually is. 16-year-old Kyra dreams of making it to the top. But on her final trial, she's teamed up with a mysterious student who isn't what he appears to be. Amidst the chaos and bloodshed, they must find a way to survive while preventing a great evil from finding its way back into the world. Why Dragon's Hide is a must-read for fans of the Arclight Saga and a good entry point for new readers. And it is. Um, that's kind of how I designed it. So it is its own story. It's separate. Taro is not in it, but... Um, it is still in the same universe. The Magisterium is there. And there are some characters that will appear in both. Kyra is in this book. In fact, she is the main character. And it's told in a first-person point of view rather than a third-person point of view. Um, for people who don't know what that means, the third-person point of view would be like me telling a story about someone, which is what my other books are written in. And first-person is uh, told uh, like saying, I did this, I did that, like kind of like Hunger Games. So it's a bit different, but I think it's probably the best thing I've ever written. I'm really excited for people to read it, and uh, I think it's, it's, how do I explain this? Like I said, it's another entry point into the series. So if you've never read any of my books, or if your friends have never read any of my books, you can start on book zero, or you can part start in book one. If you've read book one and book two, you should 100% read book zero, because there are characters in it that will be in book three, so you have to read it. Well, I guess you don't have to read it, but you should, you really should. Because I'm going to write through book three, assuming you read it. Okay. Okay, we're coming up on the 30-minute mark, so I'm going to bow out for now. Thank you for enduring my random rambling. I'm trying to make this like a regular thing where I can talk to people and answer questions, but you know, we'll see what actually happens. Take care now. Oh, oh, hey, thanks, Joseph. You're awesome. You're super awesome. I need all the fans I can get. See, now it's, see people are talking, so now I feel like I have to stick around. Although he did say he has to run. Okay. <laughs> I think I'll stick with what I said and finish. All right. Thank you. I'll see you next week.